Mr. Jonathan. Mr. Jonathan Bidlock is a director of the governance program at the R Street Institute. He is focused on fiscal, budget, and legislative branch policy. Jonathan received his bachelor's degree in economics with minors in finance and uh, political economy from Princeton. In May, Mr. Bidlock published the known unknowns, planning for the next emergencies. The report calls for planning ahead for emergencies rather than relying on off-budget emergency spending. Thank you for agreeing to testify today, Jonathan. Appreciate it. Sorry. Thank you. Next, uh, Mr. Bidlack, for your opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman Casey, Ranking Member Braun, and members of the committee. Uh, very much appreciate today's hearing and the opportunity to testify before you. Uh, my name again is Jonathan Bidlack, uh, and as mentioned, my specialty is in budget policy and improving government efficiency to better serve constituents. The pandemic and its response imposed significant hardship on Americans, particularly the older and disabled. Being better prepared for the next crisis, whether public health or otherwise, can help ensure that no Americans are left behind. Smart planning preserves resources and ensures that any federal response benefits those who need it, rather than furthering waste and abuse. Emergency events affect vulnerable segments of the population the most, and so do the unintended consequences of poor planning and irresponsible budgeting. In everyday life, we understand that a car accident is an emergency. It requires a rapid response and temporarily special powers, like letting ambulances run red lights or speed on their way to the hospital. But increasingly, in the context of national emergencies, the executive continues to use special powers long after the crisis. Just as we don't let injured drivers run red lights on their way to physical therapy, so too must we limit emergency powers to the time of actual crisis. In recent years, the number of federally declared emergencies has increased dramatically, and so has federal spending in response. Officially designated emergency spending has totaled more than $3 trillion since 2000 but the true impact on the U.S. economy and the federal budget is much greater. The federal response to the COVID-19 pandemic cost more than $5 trillion. Spending overseas expanded dramatically during the two decades after 9-11, and disaster supplementals in our response to the financial crisis in 2008 also contributed to our increasingly tenuous federal balance sheet. Put simply, emergencies have added up especially since this spending is typically enacted without any offsets. There are also substantial private costs, and I'm thinking of closed businesses, on and under employment, and more recently, higher inflation and interest rates. Many economists at the Federal Reserve and others have written about the relationship between expansive pandemic-related spending and persistent inflation. I have with me an article from CBS News, the headline of which reads, Inflation is slamming U.S. seniors. It's a scary time, one disabled widow said. Unchecked spending poses real costs to Americans who are lower income or on a fixed income. With each additional unexpected expenditure, vulnerable populations are threatened further by trust fund insolvencies, crowding out other budgetary priorities, and potential benefit cuts if nothing is done. As a recent Social Security trustees report warned, the odds are rising of a 23% benefit cut as soon as 2033 without a change in the status quo. Fortunately, there are reforms that Congress should consider. These include limiting the length of emergencies and restoring the proper role of Congress. The executive branch must often act quickly, but the legislature should not allow emergencies to extend unchecked for months and years. The recent bipartisan effort to end emergency declarations uh, after 30 days absent congressional action is a good idea. And when an emergency has been declared, Congress should target funds and demand transparency. For example, instead of trying to claw back pandemic funding after the fact, Congress could have required states to publish how they spent funds as a condition of aid in the first place. Most states were able to respond to the pandemic thanks to the strength of their budget stabilization funds. We should explore such options at the federal level to alleviate fiscal strain in times of crisis. As we now re-enter a world of federal spending limits, such mechanisms could ensure that adequate funding for emergencies is immediately available, rather than relying on off-budget spending and gimmicks. Well-designed fiscal rules in other countries should also be considered. 
Sweden's entitlement program guardrails have become a worldwide model, as just one example, instituted to safeguard their safety net programs. And finally, we should help people continue to save. The federal government can incentivize individuals to prepare for emergencies and make existing savings vehicles more flexible. Efforts enacted in last year's omnibus, including the chairman's ABLE 2.0, should be expanded to further increase savings opportunities for Americans with disabilities. Thank you again for holding today's hearing and for your consideration of these important issues. And I look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Bidlock. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, Bidlock, um, earlier we talked about uh, on all emergency spending, we basically borrow the money. Uh, done nowhere else through insurance, through any other government entity. They have to deal with emergency funds and rainy day funds. And I think you said that over the last two decades, it's north of maybe $10 trillion that have been added to the federal debt. Um, can you explain why a rainy day fund, an emergency fund, would actually be a better way of doing it? Yeah, thank you for the, thank you for the question. Um, I think if I start, I mean, if you just consider a, you know, a quick back of the envelope calculation, I mean, the, the cost of war project at Brown University estimates that we've spent around $8 trillion in total on, on the war on terror. And, and that was spending that was not expected pre-2001. Uh, if you consider the, the money that we spent on the pandemic, that's another $5 trillion. Uh, that was obviously not really expected prior to early 2020. Uh, and then if you consider the, the $3 trillion in sort of uh, officially designated emergency spending, that's, that's alone is, you know, $15, $16 trillion out of an increase in the national debt of $26 trillion over that time. You're talking well north of 50%. So um, I think that the impact, you're correct to point out, of, of emergency spending, whether officially designated or otherwise, uh, has been very significant. Um, you know, in the context of emergency funds, I mean, I think to some degree it speaks for itself. I mean, if we, if we look at how states were able to respond in the pandemic, uh, they had, you know, uh, their, their emergency funds were pretty much uh, flush with cash in the early stages, and uh, uh, you know that put them in a very, a very strong position. I think that there's been a lot of sort of uh, you know misinformation, maybe that it was a requirement that they they get funds from the federal government to replenish their emergency funds, but their emergency funds were in very strong shape early on, um, and the same was true even going back to the 2008 financial crisis, and so. Um, the value here is that, you know, you have actual funds put aside uh, for these types of expenditures, um, which, look, is the kind of thing that we all do in our own private lives and that we expect even businesses to do uh, to, to plan for unforeseen events. And the other underappreciated part, I think, of emergency funds is just the speed. You know, as, as we learned in the context of the pandemic, the ability to respond quickly to an emergency or disaster situation is incredibly important. And so it's not just that you have money, it's that you also are able to respond in a much quicker fashion. And so um, I think it's something that we should definitely consider at the federal level, especially when we consider that, that um, you know, in many, at many points in time, the federal government has served as sort of a de facto uh, backstop. And so uh, it's very important that we have the, our federal finances in as strong of a position as possible. And an emergency fund could very well be a, a, an important component of that. And I think sooner or later, when you um, have any understanding of uh, fiscal policy and macroeconomics, um, you are going to pay the piper with inflation and other things that uh, happen due to that approach. Um, so when it comes to um, how would you, uh, what policy proposals out there, is there anything else other than creating a rainy day fund, which is probably unlikely here. I don't think we'll do that until you hit the ditch fairly hard. Any other policy proposals that would make it a more sane approach rather than, we know the need is there, but it's the approach in this place that defaults to the, uh, to me, shameful process of just putting more and more debt onto every uh, body that's in a future generation, kids and grandkids. Yeah, I mean, I like to be a little bit more optimistic, perhaps, and uh, hope that we might be able to go and uh, uh, implement an emergency fund. 
Um, look, I think there are a lot of lessons from the states and from, from other countries. I mean, I, I referenced in my written testimony the, the, the Swedish case where uh, Sweden was actually found themselves in a very similar situation in the 1990s. They had a generous social safety net. Um, they don't sit on a large amount of oil reserves like their, their neighbor to the West. And uh, they had to really think about how can we ensure the sort of programs that many people are reliant on. And, and they implemented statutorily, uh, you know, uh, budget caps that uh, um, put some level of, re of restraint on, on their expenditures. And you see very effectively that, that countries like Sweden or Switzerland, perhaps being the other uh, example that's often used, um, those countries have tended to respond far more effectively uh, to, to crises and done so in a way that didn't result in just blowing up their budgets. So another, they have a fairly, uh, they got somewhat larger uh, central government uh, probably budget, but they don't borrow money to spend what they want to spend, and they're taking the responsibility of putting savings into emergency funding, uh, which again is what all other places have to do. This is the only place that seems to try to violate that rule routinely. Yeah, I mean, you know, in this country, we just went through the debt limit uh, 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 fiasco, crisis, whatever you want to call it. And I think there's a, a lot of acknowledgement from people on both sides of the aisle that the way that we deal with the, uh, our, our sort of expenditures in this country is not ideal. Um, there are virtually no other countries that have this exact same process. I think Denmark is the only other one. And, and instead what they do is they, they cap their expenditures as a function of expected revenue, which is itself a function of what they've taken in recently and what they expect in the short term. And that's a much smarter way of doing it and it gives you a lot more flexibility to respond to unforeseen events. I mean, in the Swiss case, they don't have, a, uh, they don't have an emergency fund explicitly, that, but they're able to engage in emergency spending and then it sort of, uh, they, that impacts what they're able to spend in the coming five or six years. And so um, again, these types of lessons, I think, are very important and, and, and big picture uh, have, have wide-ranging implications for both the finances of the country and how we deal with emergencies. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'll just add one quick additional point, which is that I think that we do also need to take sort of a, a long-term uh, approach to this as well. I mean, we have plenty of Americans who are living in areas that are particularly vulnerable, and, and we know that we have uh, huge problems with the National Flood Insurance Program, for example, and a number of my colleagues have done work on that topic. So. Um, I think that uh, we, we do also need to kind of think about some of the long-term implications and some, sometimes some of the perverse incentives that have been created by, by poor federal policy through the years. 